Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And I am joined once again today by my good friend, Dr. Rodney Fierce. Rodney, how are you doing today? I am doing well. I'm literally just off of a plane from Savannah, Georgia, so I'm a bit punchy, which hopefully will be good. <laughs> but I am, I am doing well. Make me feel more guilty, why don't you? Because <laughs> I know I am ruining your, your Sunday morning because of the time zone change or the, the time difference between us that I ruined your very early mornings. So I thought today we could talk a little bit. Uh, my mind has been on adaptation recently about uh, a lot of the different adaptations like the Wheel of Time adaptation, the new Halo adaptation, uh, Rings of Power, which has been announced on Amazon, but the new Batman movie. And mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of... Uh, media products, be it film or television, that are based on existing intellectual properties that are comic books or literature. And I know that you have experience of the dramatization of texts because of your, your experience at Princeton. And also one of the things that comes up in fan discourse, and I do apologize in advance if I offend anyone, I don't mean to, because I want to treat this sensitively, but diversity casting as an issue and staying true to the lore what can be changed what can't be changed and fan discourse from i would hope a very small element of fans that is rooted in misogyny homophobia racism and even sometimes unconsciously but it's it's a very complex subject because a adaptation is big it, it covers a lot of different things, but also there are a lot of different strands, some of which are general and some are text specific. So I wanted to thank you because this is not a, an easy topic and I know it is a very hot button issue for people, but I thought that having a genuine open discussion about it would be helpful. I agree. I, I think that when we close off those discussions, we make it so that there is no progress that is made in these types of, in these types of, in these areas. And I, I was having a conversation with one of my dear friends who's the head of the theater department at the school that I work at. And we were talking about adaptation and she's, we were, we were talking about John Singleton's Boys in the Hood, which is one of the most beautiful films I have ever seen. And she said, you know, if I wanted to do that adaptation as a white woman from Northern California, there would be significant pushback to me doing that, whereas you would be able to do that. And I said, and that's where the problem lies because why should you, so long as you do your homework and you have researched the heck out of this and you are intentional and thoughtful about this, these people and this narrative and this neighborhood to bring it to life, why should you be able to do it when not be able to do it when I can? Because what happens in Boys in the Hood has nothing to do with my personal lived experience. I grew up very economically privileged. I was a debutante escort for heaven's sake. I mean, I don't understand what was going on in Compton and Watts in the 90s. That was not my experience. And so the idea that because I'm a black male, I should be allowed to do this and given a pass whereas someone else of a different race or gender might be called on the carpet for that doesn't really make sense. And it ignores the fact that I think at, at its core, what the arts and media and is able to do is to allow us to understand other people's experiences. And I think you have to do a lot. I mean, I would, if I was to adapt Boys in the Hood into a play, I would have to do as much research as my white female head of theater department friend would because just because I'm black I have such a different I've had such a disparate experience from the people in that narrative that it is essentially like I'm, I'm looking at people who are nothing like me so I would have to do as much work well it, it reminds me a very brief digression here is an anecdote uh, when I was living in England uh, I was sitting with a group of friends and they were asking me about the history of Ireland and one of my one of my close friends uh, has her doctorate in political and religious history of Ireland, particularly of the, the 19th and early 20th century. And I just then immediately directed every single question to her. And she is English. And everyone's going, but AP, why do you keep, I went, she's the expert on this. What do you think I have genetic knowledge? What is it about 
you know, I can talk about my lived experience of growing up where I grew up, but I, I can't talk about the history of Ireland. It's not that, you know, it, I just, oh, hang on a sec. Let, let me go into my genes and, and find all of this. And I think part of that is it is important that lived experience is considered. And I think mm -hmm. I, both of us would agree on that, that lived experience is very important, uh, yes, particularly yes. for adaptation and for narrative. But at the same time, as you said, literature and narrative and storytelling has always been about trying to show us other experiences and closing down avenues to express that and explore that to greater or lesser extents, to greater or lesser success. And I'm not saying that all of them are the same. They're, they're not. But there are, that is one aspect. It's an important aspect, but it's only one aspect of this. I agree. Oh, well, that's agree. good. We'll just wrap up here then. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> because, well, the, a lot of this came up because of, um, do you remember when Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings came out? Yes. No, you and I are in similar fields, or at least we, we both were. Do you remember any of our Tolkien scholar friends being a smidge upset at Peter Jackson's adaptation of The Lord of the Rings? I remember there being a ton of ups. I, and Peter, I, Lord of the Rings is one of those texts that is looked at as being, I don't want to use the word holy, but sort of in, in that level, I think of reverence for people which I find interesting. But I remember there was a lot of, of griping and grumbling about that. And not just from a racial standpoint, even from a gender standpoint, because to put to give Arwen something to do, <laughs> they had to cut out other characters and give Arwen so that she wasn't just mooning over Aragorn. The, the, um, the tasks of other characters, because otherwise, I mean, it's such a male driven narrative minus Arwen with the Witch King. And so if you wanted Arwen to be something more than just literally a princess in a tower, <laughs> we had to adapt and massage this narrative so that her character is, is weightier and meatier. Although I would have to say, they, when Arwen replaces Glorfindel <clears throat> in that scene, I had, because in the, the Bakshi animation, Glorfindel is replaced by Legolas. Mm. Um, but so replacing... Glorfindel with Arwen. No, I have no problem with that. It was when the scene continued and they they cross the ford and Arwen refuses the lure of the ring race on Frodo's behalf. And that's where I went, that I have a problem with. And it wasn't that it was given, it wasn't that it was Liv Tyler playing Arwen. It was, this was the whole, one of the major reasons why Frodo is trusted to go on the quest because even while wounded by the mortal knife, even while exhausted, even while under the, the influence of the ring calling to him and the Nazgul calling to him, he had the strength of character to refuse them. And it was that he, he stood up against that temptation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now in this version, he's a sack of potatoes yep. with his eyes rolling up into his head, passed out on the back of Arwen's horse and Arwen refuses the ring race. And you go, well, fine, send Arwen on the quest. There is a lot, I, um, there's a lot of that in, particularly in the first, in the Fellowship of the Ring in the first film, and certainly more, I think, in the second film. And there's one point at which Sam just says, I'll literally carry you, and then sort of does. There's a point at which Frodo does become sort of a metaphorical princess in the tower, <laughs> where for all of the fortitude that he's supposed to have, it's other people saving him time and again, rescuing him. And th there's a lot of talk about how strong he is, but I do think one of the sacrifices in the adaptation is us being able to see it. But I also think Jackson strengthened the notion of fellowship. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, obviously I, I think Tolkien drew on his experiences at war of the, the soldiers going out with their working class bat boy or Batman, uh, who's Sam, you have Frodo, Merry and Pippin are all very much the, the young officer types. Yep. Um, and the, the bond of brotherhood that developed on campaign. I think Jackson 
took that element and strengthened it, although it did lead to a reduction in the strength of character of Frodo because mm -hmm. he was relying much more on other people around him. So uh, again, this goes to, I think, adaptation and what adaptation is doing, because do you want it to be superficially similar to a text? Do you want it to be thematically similar to a text, even if they change scenes and character names? Um, I don't know, uh, there have been a number of, obviously, uh, different adaptations of Beowulf, and one of mm -hmm. which I think stars, stars Jim Caviezel, and it's a science fiction version of it. And I think it's called Outlander, but it is very much <laughs> part of Beowulf, where he's an alien, a human alien who's crash landed in a sort of Viking era settlement with, and the monster is uh, an alien as well of a different type. And it's, but you can see it's all based on Beowulf mm -hmm. and it's all about that saga. And the, then the, the special sword that he has is actually a shard of the, the spaceship that is made of the special metal. Like all of these mm. things tie in. So thematically, you can see a lot of the elements of that hero's story from Beowulf. But at the same time, it, it's not Beowulf. It's radically different. Mm -hmm. So is it an adaptation of Beowulf? That's an interesting question. And I do believe there's a point at which, and I, I have this issue all the time with things that I love that get adapted, where once you've strayed so far from the source material, just call it something else. Like you're just shamelessly yanking in the name because it is an established brand and you sort of need, you want the fan base and you want the association with that name in order to be able to draw bodies into the seats. And so I, I do think that when you're looking at, and, and uh, of course, all of my examples are flying out of my head as I want them to readily be recalled. But I do think that when you adapt something, you have to be incredibly intentional to authorial intent and to theme and also to keep audience in mind. I'll give you <clears throat> a children's lit example since that's my sort of bread and butter. Because you brought up Princeton. When I adapted... Jam Barry's Peter Pan, Peter and Wendy, for my senior thesis play at Princeton. I made a couple of key changes, but that I thought I needed to do for my American audience. So I didn't, I basically, in some ways, de Britished the script. And by that, I mean, I took out the obvious, sort of super overt references to Britain, partly because I didn't want to make my 21 year old cast do British accents. And also because I said, within this play, we're dealing with different classes of people. And so those accents would be different depending on class. And Americans are weird about class. But also, I thought there are certain words in here that don't make sense. So like, for instance, in the original play, after Wendy and John and Michael bring the lost boys home, and Mrs. Darling says she'll adopt them. And they're fretting about where are we going to put all of these boys? You know, we have three kids now, we have like nine. Where are we putting them all? And Wendy says, oh, well, they can sleep in the living room. We'll just have to remove the beds on first Thursdays. And I know what that means. First Thursdays were the days where ladies did social calls. And so the beds have to be removed so that women are not coming into the house. Be like, why do you have nine beds in your living room? But an American audience is not going to know what First Thursdays is, are, and Downton Abbey hadn't come out yet, so that's not going to come back into the lexicon in the early 2000s. So I removed lines like that, or at least changed them, so that the audience wouldn't be head-scratching. But in terms of theme and character, I was very intentional about making certain that I stayed true to what Barry wanted. And I read so much material, because he wrote several things, P Peter and Wendy, the play, is really the third Peter Pan adaptation that he has done. He starts with The Little White Bird, and then he does Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens, and then he does the play and then the novel of the play. And so I read them all as I was trying to do this. And so I think I got away with, hopefully I got away, with setting it in a place that wasn't overtly British because I kept all of the other themes about childhood that are at the center of the narrative and that I think really sort of transcend it being British or really being Scottish, if I want to be true to my own dissertation talking about Barry. Because I think if you asked the most powerful adaptations of that story, 
frankly, I think of the Mary Martin musical and the Disney film. Now, I think if you ask people what Peter Pan is, those are the two things they're going to reference first. And, and I mean, Mary Martin was from Texas. There was not even an attempt at a British accent where she's concerned. And Bobby Driscoll, who was the voice of Peter Pan in the Disney film, also is not doing a British accent. And so he's sort of American. Well, and I, I, sorry, just to interrupt very briefly for please. a second. Given Dick Van Dyke's English accent in Mary Poppins, which would have been <laughs> of a similar era of, and style of acting, maybe it was a good thing that those accents weren't attempted. I, I shudder to think the close, the horror that I would have at those is the same. I remember Gone with the Wind was produced like the play was produced in Britain and I remember hearing critics saying oh my god those accents the British the British attempting to do this like southern Georgian accent is just in, it's insane <laughs> to try to do that I, I so I think you're right I think we were all spared <laughs> spared mercifully from those not being there but I think hopefully that example goes to what it is that you're talking about a bit in that yeah. like there are sacrifices one has to make to appeal to a broader audience, but we have to be very intentional about what we are sacrificing. Yeah, and that's, I think any, almost everyone understands when you adapt something, you, from one medium to a different medium, dependent on the media that you have transferred the, the text into, changes have to be made. What mm -hmm. the argument comes down to then, I, I think a lot of the times is, oh, that change, it doesn't bother me, therefore it is not an important change, that's fine. That change bothers me. Why did you change that thing? Mm. And then the lack of, uh, sometimes I think it's a lack of awareness of, well, okay, that change bothered you, but it doesn't bother me. Whereas the one that you thought was fine is one that bothers me. Mm. So if, if we put both of us together, we both have a problem with changes being made, but we're mm -hmm. identifying some as good changes and they are different and some as bad changes. And yes. those are actually different. So we know that changes have to be made, but talking about um, Peter Pan, almost all the stage productions of Peter Pan that I have ever seen, Peter is played by a woman. Yes. And of course, I, uh, one of the major reasons for that was a lot of the times the harness used for the flying scenes <clears throat> is it's quite uncomfortable for uh, men to wear, but True. also uh, smaller, uh, typically casting a smaller uh, female actor who looks younger and can mm -hmm. play that boyish thing with the the high uh, a higher voice, but obviously can work the same rates or and the same amount of time as an adult. So yes. you don't have to have multiple child actors, mm -hmm. um, and it's a complex role. But we never had an outcry about oh, the, it's not Patricia Pan that progressive liberal agenda <laughs> sneaking women into Peter Pan. <laughs> True. Very true. Um, Very true. And it's funny because that, so it also comes out of pantomime tradition, um, moving from sort of the 19th into the 20th century that women are, are playing these male roles. And in fact, in the early productions, not only was Peter played by a woman, but Michael Darling, the youngest child, Darling child was played by um, a female actor, as were several of the Lost Boys as well. And it's for the reasons that you've just articulated. I think part of it is, you know, you need them to be young and to look commiserate with Wendy and you can get the same amount of time out of these adult actors, whereas they're not overtly male. I also think there's a sexuality embedded in Barry's text that I think is always there and he intended it to be there. I think if you put a male actor in that role, it heightens it in a way that I'm not certain they wanted in earlier productions. And if you look at the Jeremy Sumter adaptation of Peter Pan, where he plays Peter, it's the first time I ever remember a male playing it. And one of the reasons I love it is because it does heighten that. But I also can understand that that might make some people uncomfortable and that is sort of bucking tradition. But you're also correct that no one looked at that and thought there's a liberalist agenda embedded in J.M. Barry trying to like, He's not questioning gender conformity <laughs> here when he does his play. It's, you know, we have this play is running for a year and a half and we need someone who's not going to age so much that all of a sudden they can't play this role. And I, I think that 
part of this, I think, is because the, the tradition of theatre has always had male actors and female actors playing roles. And, mm -hmm. you know, like the Elizabethan period, and they were all male actors. True. The, the, uh, so gender, as it was being represented, it was about the character, not the actor. Yes. And yet at the beginning, we were talking about the lived in experience and the personal experience now being a very important component of certain things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not that any one of these things is absolutely this is the thing. It's all of these are in tension with one another. It's a balancing act between multiple aspects, particularly in adaptation and casting that mm -hmm. have to balance different aspects of this. And you ultimately cannot please everyone because sure. everyone has has different things that they care about more than others but to take a, a play like Othello Othello with its very strong focus on race yes. and representation of race to cast me as Othello I think would raise a lot of eyebrows on the other hand if you have a school that is, as is quite typical still in, in certain parts of where I live, mm -hmm. where you would have, say, an all-male school or an all-female school or uh, quite often white, all white, is Othello then a text that can never be adapted and performed by that school because they do not have someone of an appropriate uh, ethnic background? That is a fascinating question. Uh, it actually is one that I have run up against uh, in my own in my own work. I've had people talk to me about that, and I, even Laurence Olivier, who did Othello in Blackface, now and even at the time, people were a little squeamish about that. Yeah. Um, and now, certainly retroactively, people are much more attuned to why that shouldn't have been happening. And I think with Othello. I can tell you my personal opinion on it, and I don't think the, that that is, is sort of a mainstream opinion. I want Othello to be done. I think Othello should be done. I think we might have to talk about how we represent Othello if you don't have someone of the right race to do that play. Yeah. But I think that it is an important enough play that I don't want to see it go away because I, 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 the historian in me realizes the value of that play. And I think there are other plays sort of subsequent, obviously, to Othello that I think get it a similar experience. But I think if, particularly since we're talking about adaptation, if you want to see how some of these themes have evolved over time, this play is central to that. And I, I think you need to be able to do it. Yeah, and it's... Again, I think anyone who had an all-white school and they, they wanted to put on a school play, let's do Othello because it's a really important play and we want to raise this awareness. That's one of those ones that you would, they, you would hope the drama department would go, right, we need to have a very serious think about how to do this that mm -hmm. is not offensive because the purpose of that play is not to cause offense it's an investigation of something that provides a contrast to how society is now. Well, mm -hmm. hopefully provide a strong contrast to how society is now, or to show us elements of our society that maybe need improvement. That is mm -hmm. part and parcel of what the play is. In addition to the story and the entertainment and the great production values and the sets and the fantastic dialogue mm -hmm. that, Narrative is not just one thing. And it's representation, I think, of, of race and gender and sexuality in film and in television. And I think, because I think in theater, it's a much safer area for this because it is a long tradition. It's well established. And, yes. and people are much more accepting of that in adaptation. Mm -hmm. Um, because we're like, how many different versions of Hamlet have you seen, or or Romeo and Juliet have you seen, or <laughs> let's let's take Romeo and Juliet, West Side Story. <clears throat> yes, you know it's taking Romeo and Juliet and adapting it into a different context with mm -hmm. diff different ethnic groups and different dynamics, 
but it's the same story. It's being explored in a different way because mm -hmm. it's the universal experience. Yes, it's yeah. an illustration of a cultural moment and uh, uh, an aspect of that and for consumption for a modern audience. And so all of all of these things, I think, are important considerations. I agree. Well, and it's it's I'm glad that you brought up West Side Story. Uh, partly because I adore the musical and I love Spielberg's adaptation of it. But I think his is a, a nearly flawless example of how you can adapt a story and also correct some of the mistakes that might have been made with earlier iterations of it. So for instance, in the original production, Rita Moreno was the only person of Puerto Rican descent, and even she had to put on brown face to make her skin darker because they assumed Puerto Ricans looked a certain way. The rest of the cast is played by white people. And so Steven Spielberg, as he adapts it, is intentional about his casting so that the Puerto Rican community is represented in all of its complexity. And I think that's beautiful to do. But there are a lot of people who wrote, you know, this shouldn't be done at all. This, like, you should leave West Side Story alone tell other stories, don't talk about this one. But again, this is the story that appeals to him. This is, he said he always wanted to do a musical and this is the musical he wanted to do. And if you look at how much work he put into this, the consultants that he, that he, he worked with, the historians that he worked with, that they wrote a part for Rita Moreno to come back in so that she's not just doing a cameo in this thing that won her an Oscar as the first Latina to win one, but that, deepens and enriches the complexity of racial racial progress and lack thereof in the story. What he's done is a beautiful portrait of what America is and can be in this story that is essentially set in Verona back when Shakespeare does it. And I, I think what Spielberg did is everything that adaptation can and should be because of how much time and effort and consideration he put into this, into honoring and keeping what made West Side Story such a phenomenon, but also correcting the very obvious gaffes that were made at the time that it was done because it was white gay men <laughs> at a certain time making, a, making this musical. But you raise a really, what I think is a really important point, which is uh, representation in terms of complexity, of showing all facets of something. And like, one of the examples I, I would give is in, say, The Fellowship of the Ring, mm -hmm. because there are so many different male characters, you can show uh, the heroic male character, the funny male character, the, the best friend, the slightly corrupt character. The, uh, you, know, you can run through all of the gamut of different aspects of masculinity. Yes. But if you have one female character, the burden on them to represent all of what female is, or this is only what female is. Yes. Whereas if you include greater numbers of female characters in a story, you can have a greater complexity. Yes, and yeah. if you think what, and I know people would be outraged by this, but what would happen if Gandalf were a female, played by a female actor without a beard? Mm -hmm. You know, Gandalf is not actually human. <laughs> and what what is intrinsic, intrinsically male about Gandalf? Can we not have a wise female figure? But I can I can already hear mm -hmm. people furiously typing away that how dare you do that? But what if you gender swapped the entirety of the Lord of the Rings? Every single character, if they were male, make them female. If they were mm -hmm. female, make them male. And you put it up. Therefore, you are being absolutely faithful to the text in terms yep. of like dialogue and scenes. All you've done is switch the genders. The characters are all exactly the same. But if you did that, because of an inherent uh, patriarchal male gaze that is built into our cultures, that would be seen as very uh, progressive and subversive to change these male characters to female. And it would change the dynamic of the film, even because of expectations about female characters. Except you've done none of that. You have literally swapped every single character. So the dynamics are exactly the same. It is funny you bring up that example. Um, 
A, because I, I'd love to talk about this. I think that Arwen and Eowyn have an incredible burden placed on them and Galadriel as well um, to sort of be all things female. And I think you had to give Arwen something else to do so that she's not purely decorative. Um, and so that you also understand why Aragorn wants her so much. But I think what fascinates me about fantasy and science fiction is that with these genres, you in theory have the luxury and license to recreate the world. You're not tied to the patriarchal or gender or racial structures that have, that underpin our world. You can do whatever the hell you want to, and that's the freedom of fantasy. And yet, and still we do meticulously recreate our world just with dragons and fairies and magic and, and some of those elements. And so it's, it's interesting that I think fantasy really is a battle within the human psyche and imagination for like how far we can really stretch. And I think the fact that we're having that discussion about how many people would be angry if that had been the world that had been created tells you that there are limits to what we see as being possible, even when we're given a canvas in which in theory everything is possible. And I think you're correct about, I mean, he challenges masculinity and he also gives us classed versions of masculinity. And so we see it in all of its complexity. Whereas if you look at those films, there's never a point at which Eowyn is going to be someone that Aragorn is going to throw Arwen over for. I mean, she's wonderful as a character, but Arwen is the stereotypically traditionally feminine, beautiful, aristocratic, high-born object of desire. And quest, quest reward. Yes, yes. And I mean, and is the, the reason why Aragorn, I mean, in the novel, this is more explicit, that her father says, you cannot marry her unless you fulfill your destiny. She's not marrying random mortal. <laughs> like she, she's like, no. You can marry, are you a king? No, go away. Yes. Oh, you're a king now, are you? Well, let's, let, we'll, we'll think about it. Right, and so it's, and Erwin, and I, when I look at Erwin, I, I see Katniss Everdeen, you know, 80 years down the line or however long it was but in between those two films, uh, and uh, novels and film adaptations, um, where she, because she kills the Witch King, there are elements of masculinity that are in Eowyn that are not in Arwen. And so I think we, we celebrate Eowyn for her bravery and what she does because, well, someone has to kill the Witch King. <laughs> but we want Arwen to be with Aragorn, A, because we've invested in that romance, but it also gives us a very traditional neatly tied love story that is very familiar to to our audiences that have been steeped in patriarchy etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah whereas I, I think oh sorry i think with erwin if erwin and aragorn had ended up together you're navigating masculinity and power in a way that is very different than you are if Arwen and aragorn get married um and it's interesting that obviously because Faramir is in contrast to Boromir is much more genteel and mm -hmm. you can almost say is more feminine mm -hmm. um, and he ends up with Eowyn, the, mm -hmm. the more masculine. And again, there's, there's a really interesting sexual and gender dynamic that is, is hinted at. It's, it's implicit because I think a lot of readers would never notice that um, Agreed. because you know it is it's reflected in the the text but in uh or sorry in the in the film but in the film because of casting choices because of how it's done faramir doesn't really come across as the sort of the more effeminate brother true um which is something that's kind of sort of i think hinted at i think could you argue that i think you could mm -hmm. I, I agree like, um but it it's fascinating because Obviously, with the, the Rings of Power, uh, the, the new Amazon show, which is inspired by uh, Tolkien's Legendarium and set in the Second Age, which is not as detailed as the War, War of the, the Ring. Mm -hmm. And in that, there's been a lot of discussion about diversity casting and mm. progressive politics invading. And it's, it's about the message. And you sort of go, but... This is Amazon. Amazon is their message is buy our product, make us money. That's their message. And they will do anything they possibly can. 
so sidestepping that for a moment is there i i have never had a problem with someone suggesting even with lord of the rings i'm going to make an adaptation of lord of the rings and all of gondor are now going to be people of color uh mm -hmm. to represent and then rohan we are now going to have um particularly let's say of mongolian a sort of steps culture that's going to be the representation mm -hmm. i wouldn't have a, a problem if either of those two decisions had been made because there's nothing intrinsically white about the people of gondor that is necessary in the text but the idea of them being a people onto themselves i would like to see some level of homogeneity about how they are represented and yet when it comes down to it would i really have an issue if some of the gondorians had been people of color and some of them hadn't been i go no i wouldn't have it wouldn't have bothered me it's and it's it's strange when i think about it conceptually i want them as a homogenous race mm -hmm. but when i think about what is important i go well i'm much more interested in actually the really good actors on screen delivering good scenes and delivering good lines mm -hmm. and the racial component for me is less important but of course i'm part of a racial representation that has always been represented Fair. so that's why it's it's not as big an issue for me but i can i can understand tokenism in casting could be incredibly insulting um as a way to do it it is uh so there are a couple of things here one of the things that were really challenging is whiteness as default which has been a problem in literature in general and i think yeah. in looking at fantasy adaptations specifically and i so my rule of thumb both in my own work and when i'm evaluating other people's work critically is i love the idea of exploring the the bounds of race and gender so long as it doesn't run contrary to the historical narrative or the integrity of the text that we're working with. Because again, it goes back to something you and I said when we first started chatting, which is at a certain point, you've gone so far away from the source material that you've, you've strayed into something else entirely. And it's, it's, it's this thing in name only. And I think if you look at, if you take Lord of the Rings, and then I actually would love to talk about the Hunger Games as another sort of iteration of this, because I, I, I do think it, 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 tracks um there is nothing in lord of the rings that dictates that these characters have to be white as you've already articulated there's nothing changing their races or even if we wanted to go that far changing the gender if you we go with your gender flip which i totally want to see someday um there's you're not challenging the the narrative in a way that destroys its integrity. Mm -hmm. And so really, I think, and I do the same thing. Like I, in my head, everyone in Lord of the Rings is white. And I think that's probably because I, I too have internalized some of that. I'm, well, you know, we're, we're all subject to culture. We, we all have uh, the, the entire publishing, the publishing industry, Hollywood, uh, television production for so long. Mm -hmm. has been dominated by the editors, producers, uh, owners, um, publishing houses. It was white stories written mm -hmm. by white authors for white people. And yes. oh, out of the, you know, everyone can read them. There's stories for everyone, but that's who was picked. That's who was promoted. Mm -hmm. And there are obviously, there, there are exceptions. No one is saying that it's 100% this way but there was a predominant sort of cultural particularly in the uh, and that we are talking particularly in the anglosphere yes um, and anglophone literature but there was a very strong element of that that anyone of color and even uh female authors quite often were exceptions to the general rule yes. and when you have that as a cultural product that inspires the next generation of authors to mimic and play with what came before but they think mm -hmm. that's the format which inspires the next generation of authors yes. and it has a generational impact where but that's what the story is and you go but why and th that commercial cultural racial gendered aspect of the industry 
Mm -hmm. And even the people who could afford to write is another, but the economic aspects of this as well favored certain authors of other over others. Yes. And so I think we've all internalized that to a greater or lesser extent because mm -hmm. it, it has colonized our imagination. Um, and because we are now aware of this, and as you pointed out, you can correct what were mistakes in say the, the adaptation of West Side Story, but even if it's not mistakes, you can go, well, for a modern audience, as you did with uh, Peter Pan, go, what can I do for a modern audience to make this more for them and not just for a rigid adherence mm -hmm. to the text? Because when we're talking about modern audiences worldwide for these products, these are TV shows and films for America and Canada and the UK and Spain and France and Germany and China and, well, we won't mention that other market, uh, but <laughs> Australia, um, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, South Africa, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Brazil, Chile. Like, it is a worldwide audience. Yes. It's not just your hometown. It's not just for you and your friends. And it's not just for your local group that enjoys that particular thing. It's for mm -hmm. an entire world. And adaptation is, I think, in general, although there are exceptions, for a broader audience than the original text. I think adaptation tends to seek out a broader audience. I agree. Well, I also think that adaptation is a way to lure in a broader audience to looking at that source material as well. That if you do adaptation well, people will say, I want more, where is more? Oh, you haven't made another movie because it takes a year to do that? Oh, this person wrote 14 books? Well, great, let's go look at those. And then you're able to lure those audiences in. I think and the reason I, I brought up The Hunger Games because it's a good example of how deeply we've internalized whiteness as default. There, were up, there was an uproar when Rue was played by that beautiful black actress, when in the novels, she wrote that the people of that district are dark skinned. And so many readers literally overlooked the detail. <laughs> and coded them as white because that's the way they saw that. Even in District 12, Katniss is described as olive skinned. She's not sort of alabaster skinned, but in the cultural imagination, that was the way that they looked. Oh, and we, so it, it, was, it fascinates me that even with the detail written out in there, people can overlook it because we, have so, we are so accustomed to that default. And it's fascinating. I mean, obviously, I talk a lot about Stephen Erickson's Malazan Book of the Fallen. And in that, like, that is a, a heavily non-Anglo-focused series, that the vast majority of characters in it are from completely different cultures and ethnicities and skin colors and mm -hmm. races. And yet, anytime I see something about a fan casting, the vast majority of the fan casting actors that get picked to play certain roles will be white actors. Mm -hmm. when, when you look at the text and you look at the descriptions and you find, oh, they're, of, they're from Unta. And you look at the text for the, because Erickson is very, uh, he actually doesn't put in very many physical descriptions of specific characters, mm. but he does have descriptions of skin color uh, of epicanthic folds uh, for eyes, uh, different jaw lines, and, and to give you an idea of the physical characteristics of mm -hmm. different parts of the world. And yet people ignore that because that's not who they imagine the character as in their head. And you go, yes. that's fine for you. But it's nice, I think, for entire audiences who have been excluded from classic fantasy, either intentionally or I would actually suspect far more unintentionally mm -hmm. by authors who just, it never occurred to them to write characters that way. That now we have an opportunity to be more inclusive with our audience and our fandom and say, okay, so there's an elf with a different skin color. 
they are still really long lived and they have pointy ears and they can mm-hmm. fire a bow. Yep. Um, it's a fantasy race in this world. Is is ethnicity so radically important to the construction of what an elf is that it has to be mapped into casting decisions? And I would say no. And I, I think what I do as an educator and as a scholar, I'm always fighting some of those internal, those things that I have internalized. Where I, when I look at a, a, a difference in casting, I always have to ask myself, do I care about it because it's running contrary to the narrative or do I care about it for some other reasons that I've internalized and need to push back against? And I think, and this is where I, I, I think fantasy can do more of this fantasy is not history or if it is it's a history we are creating or the author is creating and so therefore that can be massaged and 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 worked and changed and so no i think so long as the ethnicity or skin color uh, or gender of a person is not so integral to the text that changing it changes the function of the narrative then there's no reason why we should be tied to those other than things that we have internalized that, as you have said, have colonized our imaginations and have made it so that we envision people looking a certain way when there's no reason why they necessarily have to be. Now, I think when we're talking historical narrative, I am much more of a traditionalist where that is concerned because I think that all people's histories should be respected. And I think sometimes, and you were talking about tokenism, I think in our effort to correct a historical wrong or to correct the sins of the past, we want to put diversity in where it doesn't actually make sense historically. And that I think becomes problematic because the I, I think the reason why we're doing it while noble doesn't make as much sense as it does in fantasy where we get to create the world from the studs on up. Do you, do you want to talk about Bridgerton? I will happily talk about this. <laughs> well, no, b- before, because I, I, you make an excellent <laughs> point, and it's one that I think we should discuss, and I think Bridgerton's an excellent example of this. But to go back to a text we mentioned earlier, this is why I think Othello is, is very interesting, because race is central mm-hmm. to the tension of that narrative. And if, if you felt uh, when you were making an adaptation that you didn't have a, um, access to an actor of color, Mm -hmm. then maybe you would actually have to rewrite it that you go, okay, we'll make a fellow of a different religion or Mm -hmm. class and work it in because it's about that difference that is, so you're staying true to one element. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that would actually have to be very carefully considered because it is a radical change Mm -hmm. to the focus of the text. But I still think it falls within an adaptation. It falls within something that very similar to um, Forbidden Planet being uh, The Tempest. Different setting, different way of articulating the tensions within it. Mm -hmm. But you can make then uh, an analogy between racial tensions and prejudice to say uh, gender or sexuality or something like that, that actually Othello could be a blueprint for that story. Agreed. But it, in some respects, is radically changing Othello. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, and I, I love pushing some of the bounds of what the what that text can can support in terms of adaptation. I love seeing that. And so long as you can understand the work that has gone into doing this and the thought behind it, I think you can get away with a lot. Um, my husband and I are going to see the Oregon Shakespeare Festival is finally back and they're doing a production of The Tempest. And I looked at the casting and the casting is sort of a diversity rainbow, which I think is really cool. One thing that I has always given me some pause with The Tempest, people like to make Ariel the spirit who's enslaved to Prospero a woman because Miranda is basically the only female of consequence in the play. And that's a way of putting another female actress on, an actress on stage. I've always pushed against that, not because I don't think that an actress can play that well, but because I look at Ariel and Caliban as different functions of slavery. Mm-hmm. And you, if Caliban is played by someone who is of color, which it is going to be in this adaptation as well, I think there's a racial element to the slavery that is interesting. And I also think Ariel, who's looked at as like higher functioning, higher born, 
spirit, but still being enslaved, this male spirit enslaved to another man is different than a female spirit enslaved to a man because of the gender politics embedded. And I think when you make Ariel a female, you run a little too close to the relationship that Miranda has with her father in terms of gender politics. And I think having a male there is just more interesting to me. But that said, I see the arguments for making that a female character and I'm totally fine with doing that. And I think the play can support either reading of that. Yeah, because obviously if you if Ariel then is female, you, you play up that mirroring with Miranda. Whereas mm -hmm. as you just pointed out, if you make Ariel male, you play up the mirroring with Caliban. Mm -hmm. that it's, this is what I find so fascinating about adaptation. Depending on how we read the text, the points that we want to emphasize, the points that we want to de-emphasize, that it can give you a, on the one hand, the same story. On the other hand, it is a radically different story in certain respects. And, yes. you know, we, when people complain about adaptations, I go, but you can always go back to the source text. No one is ever taking the original away from you, that yeah. those books, those plays will, will exist. This is about a different articulation, a different vision of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes those infuriate us and we go, you completely missed the point. Or other times we go, wow, I never thought of it that way. That's, huh, that's really interesting or that's really cool or, I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm enthralled. The idea of rigid fidelity without any sort of adjudication or assessment of high priority fidelity versus low priority fidelity, what aspects are important or not important. Mm -hmm. Fidelity for fidelity's sake, I think, ends up making a very lackluster, limp, shallow adaptation. It's boring. Um, it's also safe. <laughs> but but we were, we were about to talk about uh, Bridgerton, because I think this is this is an important point, um, because there's a difference between fantasy and well, fantasy and science fiction and historical fiction or pseudo historical fiction. Agreed. And I, I, I think you have a you have a a mini rant about. Rant I do. I do. Um, it's funny. So I've been in Savannah for the last week and my husband I, 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 as much as he missed me, I think was sort of thrilled because he texted me. He's like, I'm binging season two of Bridget. And I was like, that's great, honey. Cause you know, when I come back, <laughs> we're not, we're not, I'm not watching this with you. And my reasoning is because what it, I, it plays fast and loose with history in a way that I think is irresponsible. And I'll explain what I mean by that. If Bridget had been set in an alternate universe, or it had, if it was a fantasy, or if you said, you know, this is alt history, I'd be all about it. But you have intentionally said it in our time, in our history. And to make the Duke in the first season black doesn't make any sense. His, it is historically not just inaccurate, but it's sort of deeply problematic. And I say that because Britain was at the height of the African slave trade at the time that this is happening. So you're telling me that you have black, like, you cannot make black people in the British aristocracy and not meaningfully talk about what that means for the British aristocracy. And you can't just say the king married a black woman and loved her so much that he changed the whole aristocracy because A, you can't do that in quite that way that quickly. And B, they're making, money it's the underpinning of their society you can't say he threw out <laughs> he threw out slavery and all the money that it brings because he loved this woman a no he didn't and b you can't part of adaptation if you're making a structural change you have to build that into the narrative in a way that makes sense and in a way that makes us question or deepen it. You can't say I'm doing what I'm doing and just don't look at what's happening here. That's sort of the Wizard of Oz, man behind the curtain-esque element of storytelling. Like, just don't pay attention to this. And if you do, you're wrong. And so, yes, are there some people who had racial reasons for not wanting to see that? Sure. That's not my reason. My reason is that 
this is such a radical change to Britain then and now, because as far as I know, the only black member of the British aristocracy is Meghan Markle. To this day, as far as I know, the only member sort of that high up in the British peerage system is she who married Prince Harry, which is fascinating. But also, if you're going to change this society and make it a multiracial one, then you have to account for all of the other things that have to change with you doing that. Because otherwise, for me, it takes me out of the story. Yeah, and that's the ramifications of changes like that to historical texts. I think that those things tend to have far greater ripples and ramifications and impact than if we do it in fantasy. And as you said, if Bridgerton had basically been a fantasy series, uh, there's, a, there's a Netflix show that is you know, heavily, it looks very Prussian in some respects. Was it a, a Blood and Bone, Smoke and Mirrors? Yes. Mm -hmm. Blood and Smoke. What I, I, I can't remember the name of it. So some very pretty people in it. And the costuming is lovely, but very, mm -hmm. um, very czarist, which, which is an interesting choice because politically th th there's a certain linking to that, but Fair. it looks very pretty. But setting that in the fantasy world dulls that connection yes. to that costuming choice in that it is now seen as costuming rather than a statement of political affiliation or making a statement to, to that extent. It's, it's a way of creating a visual identity. Agreed. Um, and I think if Bridgerton had been clear from the outset that it was an alternate reality, but then would you have still catered to, would it still have reached the same period romance watching audience who wanted to watch down a new slightly sexier Downton Abbey. I think it would have. I think it, I think you could have dealt with this at the very beginning. And that because once you do, it frees you to do what you want to do with your narrative. When, when you have, it liberates you from the confines of history because we know how history has, has happened. And if you'd said this is an alt history, then the sky's the limit for what you're going to do. The comparison people have made with me and I, I, I talk to them about is uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton, where he is telling a historical story. He's using period pieces to ground you, but he is not it is not a, a historical piece in the way that Bridgerton is trying to be and is claiming to be. And even everything from the black bodies on stage to the fact that rap is the language with which they are speaking is meant to show you, I'm using pieces of this to tell an American story and to prove that it is a universal one, but I'm not grounding it 1000% in this period. And I think the fact that he was so intentional about that gives him the creative license to create this beautiful multicultural narrative that is really about a bunch of white founding fathers and their wives and their families. And so you can have, that can be, that can exist because he was very purposeful about showing you with everything on stage that while I'm representing America, I am not recreating 1776. And I think Bridgerton wanted to have it both ways. And for me, that doesn't work because you're pushing against the, you're pushing against history, but you're not accounting for history. Well, I think it's actually worse than that. It's ignoring history. Yeah. And it, so it's not even that it's pushing against it. If it was pushing against it, you could talk about it in terms of a counter narrative, mm -hmm. but it's not even a counter narrative because it's don't, don't pay attention to all of the really horrible aspects that we are not showing you. Just look at the pretty people. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was interesting. The, someone had written a, a very interesting article about the costuming of, of some of the character of one of the characters in season two, who was um, using Indian silk and the sari and all of, I, I think it was that sort of inspired costuming, but without talking about the East India Company. You go, the, 
the disconnect between those different things. Whereas if you stick it in a fantasy world, you go, right, let's imagine an alternate history for this period of England. Susanna Clarke's uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is an alternate history. Uh, the, Naomi Novik's um, Tremor Rare, Tremor, I can never say the name of the series. The one with the dragons um, is again, Napoleonic. And so alt history with fantasy elements. Um, like all of these things, like changing those elements to go, yeah, I am aware of what the history is, but what if I change this thing? And that, when it is done deliberately like that, to think about the ramifications and the changes, instead of sweeping them under the carpet, it's, it's dealing with it as a counter narrative rather than just, just ignoring the, the difficult things. Agreed. Well, and I, I think alt history fascinates me because to think what if, what if colonialism hadn't happened this way or what if it had happened a different way or what if it hadn't happened like those are are conversations i've always game for another um historical adaptation that is driving me bonkers they're doing the anne boleyn henry the eighth story and they cast a black actress as anne boleyn and i saw all these articles written about it and i thought you can't do i mean you can do whatever you want obviously but we know what anne boleyn looked like we know who she married. We know the family she's from. There are portraits that show it. We know that she gave birth to a white redheaded child who becomes the queen of England after her siblings reign and then die. I mean, we, we know precisely what she looked like. And so, again, if you're going to make this choice, you have to meaningfully deal with the ramifications of that choice. You can't put a Black actress in that role and just pretend like nothing is changed here because something is radically changed there. And to say, you know, well, women were minorities and she's a minority, this actress, so she, of course that allows her to like deepen Anne Boleyn's character. Well, no, because the white aristocracy is just very different than a black woman rising to these heights of power at this specific time. I mean, there's so much work that I think you have to do in order to make that narrative fit and to give it the complexity that you want. But to not do that work, I think, does it a service to the very capable actress, but also to the history that you're doing. You're playing fast and loose with history. And one thing that does drive me a bit mad when I'm looking at diversity sort of in general is this idea that because colonialism happened the way that it does and because white stories have been the dominant, we can do whatever we want with them and the feelings of white people about their stories doesn't matter. Because I don't agree with that. I think we have to make room at the table for more diverse forces. We absolutely do. But I also think that that means we have to respect other people's stories, white stories included. And some stories are all white because that is part of the world as well. And I think if everyone's stories aren't respected, then how can I, I mean, if, I'm trying, oh gosh, if, um, if Philip Seymour Hoffman decided he wanted to play Martin Luther King Jr. for instance, I would be up in arms because we know what Martin Luther King Jr. looked like. And I think I'd be rightly up in arms about something like that because it's playing fast and loose with a history that is very dear to many, many people. Go back a hundred years though, and the idea of a white actor playing a person of color and Hollywood wouldn't have blinked twice. Oh True. yeah, of course. True. Um, and I think we're trying to correct, I, I, we talked about Steven Spielberg, I think he's, I think there are ways to correct for some of that, and to at least apologize for and to contextualize why they did some of the things that they do. But I think with the awareness that we have now, we have to be respectful of everyone's histories and stories going forward, because we do know better. And so I think a British story that is a period piece is something that I think you have to be deferential to and to re be respectful of. And not just to say those were colonizers at one point so I can do whatever I want with their stories and no one should complain. Whereas these other stories are sacred and we're not supposed to do anything with those or to offend these people. I think we all have to do better where that is concerned. And for me, I mean, the, the, the term I use for it is sort of lazy diversity. I don't want lazy diversity. I don't want you to just make an, uh, a character black for the sake of it being black. 
because I, I want, if you're going to do that, I want you to explore what that means. Because we can't pretend that race doesn't exist or that it doesn't bear on the way that we move through the world. And if you're going to make a choice in the real world in that way, then you have to address that. Now, I think fantasy has different rules because you get to make those rules. And so you can race and gender blind cast things in fantasy worlds and expect the audience not to be pulled out of that narrative because it's not bound to the same rules that our history is. But we're not a little orphan Annie. Mm -hmm. the, even though that is, you know, mimetic, um, it set during a certain time period, I think you could easily cast a, a young girl of color as little orphan Annie because there's nothing intrinsic about race in that about her um and that story still functions and that is because i know we, we've been talking about when taking an historical text and changing historical people mm -hmm. but obviously with fiction as soon as you start moving into fiction those lines blur and then when you move into adaptation and the practicalities of ad adaptation those lines blur even further and it's I always get uncomfortable with it must be this way because this is how it was. I much prefer looking at it going, is this important? Yes. If we change this, is this a positive change? What are the positives running from this change? What is it that we're trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Does that have ramifications for the rest of the narrative? How does that ripple across and impact the narrative in general? And does, does it make it better? in our estimation when we do the adaptation mm -hmm. and i think it's always a t i think it is always a tension between all of these different elements yes. and that's the difficulty when you have a, a narrative that's being pulled in multiple directions be because it has to be there are multiple considerations that are all important that that tension will invariably end up pulling the narrative in a direction that you or I may not like or may like, whereas other people will have exactly the opposite response. And with fantasy and science fiction, because of the removal from our world, mm -hmm. very few of the, the recent adaptations, race is not at the core of what is being discussed. And, investigated in those Agreed. and that's why i feel much more comfortable with race swapping or gender swapping um or sexuality swapping mm -hmm. a lot of these things but if someone said to me right we're going to make um gimli and legolas gay i'd go well that that changes a significant dynamic yes. or um looking at, at things like that you go because there are readings obviously of legolas and gimli's relationship as a homosexual relationship but there are a lot of other readings of that as a strong positive platonic bond of love between mm -hmm. two two disparate people from yes. two di disparate races mm -hmm. now if gimli had been cast as a person of color with legolas being the milky one you could use that platonic relationship to talk about the bridging of a uh, racial divide and how they, they were antagonistic because of this racial divide. And then at the end, so, but if you did that, you'd have to be so aware of that change. Yes. And you'd have to be very, very careful with it. Um, you couldn't just go, oh, well, we'll just make Gimli black. True. Um, I agree. It's funny because when I, I think of gay romances, potential gay romances, Lord of the Rings, the first one that comes to me is Samwise and Frodo. <laughs> but, e but even there, you're seeing a very strong, at times codependent, or codependent on one, I, I think Frodo being more codependent than Sam, um, relationship. But what you're also seeing is a relationship that crosses the class divide because yep. Frodo's of the aristocracy and Sam is not. And so the fact that they come to depend on each other and they form this deep bond is it is in some ways groundbreaking in and of itself i i don't think that making them i think making them gay 
I don't want to say it would do a disservice to that, but I think complicates it in a way that you don't need to. Yeah. I mean, you could certainly. Oh, but... Mr. Frodo, sir. <laughs> that takes on a whole different context. If it come, if it come again. But I, I do think you're right that when you make some of those structural changes, you have to think about the ripple effects in the rest of the narrative. Like, yeah. What is this going to do? Do I have to change other things down the line? How does this affect the ending? How does this affect the character arc and growth? You can't just make a change because you think it seems cool. And you, I, it, it's certainly when we're talking reality and fantasy, yes, as you've already articulated, you have a significantly more license to recreate the world. Yeah. And in fact, I think we should do so more. I wish that we would, even with some of the stories that are so, somewhat beloved. And you brought up Little Orphan Annie. It's interesting because both that and Disney's upcoming adaptation of The Little Mermaid, oh. where the little, uh, Ariel is going to be African-American, are things that I myself have thought about a lot where I thought, oh, because those for me are pure nostalgia, particularly The Little Mermaid. It's the first Disney film my parents took me to see. I was five when it came out. And I vividly remember my father taking me to see that opening night. God, you're young. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess it's all relative because to my students, I'm not young, but um, I, so for me, when I found out that that was being cast that way, I had to think, oh, right. I'm pushing against my own sense of nostalgia. Like, there's nothing that says Ariel has to be a redhead. Hans Christian Anderson didn't make her a redhead. He also didn't name her Ariel if we're really going to get down to that. But, and, but this, that's actually a really interesting one because obviously it's based on folklore and fairy tale from a let's say, a predominantly white part of the world, mm -hmm. entered into the Anglophone folklore and fairy tale sphere, has been retold and readapted multiple times, mm -hmm. uh, every single time consolidating and reaffirming that whiteness to the text. Yes. And so now, changing that, do we sort of go, oh, but it has always been done that way. It was based on folklore from a region with white people. How dare you change it? Or do we look at it and go, but ethnicity is not central. She's a mermaid. And as a mermaid, it's, it's already emphasizing difference between her culture and the culture of the prince. Yes. And so is this another way of articulating this and exploring it? And as long as, again, it's not, when it's done as a gimmick, everyone can tell when it is done mm -hmm. as a gimmick. But deepening and broadening representation in uh, film and television, I think is a genuinely good thing. Because instead of the token black friend who gets cast in a sitcom, who therefore, like we were saying earlier about um, if there are very few female characters, that the burden of representing femininity is placed on one character. When mm -hmm. you have the one character who is meant to be the token representation of entire cultures and subcultures and completely diverse groups is all being funneled down into one or two representations instead of going, no, let's have loads of people. And that way we're not depending on singular representations of any one culture. Yes. And I can tell, I mean, in my own friend group, I am the only black person in a majority white friend group that happens to be the way my friend group has shaken out and even within that there have been conversations that i've had with them about my experience and how that has changed and is divergent from from theirs that complicate the friendship because i move through the world differently than they do and explain the world differently than they do and i think where The Little Mermaid is concerned. And it's funny because Hans Christian Andersen explicitly states how fair and white it, The Little Mermaid is. Like he's intentional about that. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the tension in the story is about religion because the prince is Christian and the mermaids are pagan and they live for 300 years and dissolve into sea foam because they don't have human souls. Whereas the prince has a human soul and Ariel wants a soul. And our grandmother says, if you marry, if you join with the prince in marriage on the day he marries you, a piece of his soul will break off and live in you. 
And so the whole narrative is about her crossing these great the great divide between pagan and Christian and her becoming more Christian by her conduct than the Christian she's around. So that she's able to then earn a human soul for herself at the end. That's the, the ending of it. It's not her marriage to the prince. And so I think you do have a unique ex opportunity with The Little Mermaid to explore that same dynamic in a way that frankly, Disney overlooked the first time. Because when they adapted it the first time, they made her this amazing redheaded character, sure. But really it becomes a romance narrative and the character growth is gone. <laughs> One of the criticisms I, and don't get me wrong, I, I can narrate The Little Mermaid line by line, love the movie to death. Uh, but the- uh, I'm gonna say. Please? Any, any Disney song, that has the lyrics, it's better down where it's wetter, take it from me, <laughs> needs to be censored, needs to be censored. I, I Legitimately, I didn't get that one until I was like 25. And I was like, <laughs> ah, oh my God. <laughs> and, and I mean, my father, of course, cracked up when he heard that in 1989, but I was just like, the crab is singing and this is awesome. Um, but in that film, one of the criticisms, and I teach this with, when I do my mythology course, one of the criticisms I have always had of The Little Mermaid is that they made Ariel, she's sort of feminist for the late 80s, early 90s, but in reality, by taking out the Christian pagan dynamic, you've made this about a girl who really wants a boyfriend and wants a man and basically puts his kingdom and her kingdom in jeopardy in order for her to get what she wants. And then daddy has to make the whole thing better by giving her legs so she can go off and get married. And so they're really, I mean, you do sort of limit her and her growth by taking that out. And I think by making Ariel and the mermaids black or a different race, I think you do give her potentially, I've not seen the film obviously, like you, there is a potential for a richer narrative of this quest to find and be and become something else. And, but this is exactly what we were talking about with Romeo and Juliet becoming West Side Story. Mm -hmm. That you have that initial tension of uh, paganism and, and Christianity or uh, monotheistic religions, if you want to sort of go a wee bit broader. Mm -hmm. But you have that tension and now you can make it using that tension but let's do it in a different way for a yes. similar sort of divide because otherwise mm -hmm. you could have the little mermaid being set in northern ireland catholic protestant yep um which would be entertaining for me hearing everyone's accent but i think the rest <laughs> of the world would find it incomprehensible Fair. um so it's again it's I, I all of these things it's not that there is any one rule that you must be faithful to a text or that you you have freedom to change everything. Everything is on a spectrum and everything has to be considered. Yes. And I think when we we talk about it and when we discuss it, when we are passionate about a, a text or even a series, like a, a fantasy series, because you've spent hundreds of hours imagining that world and inhabiting that narrative and being part of it and going on these journeys with these characters because of our time investment in that and because reading is so deeply personal mm -hmm. we feel an attachment and almost ownership of that text that if someone else does not treat it the way that we think it should be treated we get annoyed we're passionate about it yes but what i have seen in terms of fan discourse is passion is one thing the level of abuse and vitriol that gets hurled online is not excused by passion because that is something that is very, very different. And I really appreciate being able to have these conversations with you because we do come from very different backgrounds and places. <laughs> Although our education is actually quite similar, sure. <laughs> amusingly enough. But you've raised some great points about historical fiction that honestly wouldn't have bothered me quite so much mm. but i can see like coming from your perspective why it would be so much more problematic whereas i'm looking at it going oh well i can kind of see what they're trying to do and you know this is because i'm not invested in that particular history or even representation mm. but woe betide 
someone changed something um, like casting a bunch of American or Australian actors in in a film who are all meant to be Irish and all attempt Irish accents and it's abominable and you'll never get your hands on me lucky charms is basically the accent they're using that I would get very offended at that and people go oh yeah but they're just trying the accent or when people misrepresent Irish mm -hmm. history or misrepresent yes. <clears throat> the political history and the religious history of of this island mm -hmm. that those things matter very much to me. Well, I, I was thinking when you were talking about the first thing that came to my mind was Kenneth Branagh's Belfast. And of course, he was not going to miss. I mean, that history is his own. So he was going to be very intentional about what he did with it. But I think that also proves your point that these histories matter to all of us. And for those of us who love literature, as all of your viewers do, literally, like, these books, I remember something my grandmother said to me. Um, I was a voracious reader and she very much fed that. And she said, Rodney, these books can take you all over the world if you will let them. They can become closer to you than your own family if you let them in. And that's true. These narratives that I've spent my whole life studying have become like family to me. And I think the passion that you're talking about comes from when you love something so deeply, you do want certain things from it. I also think that love can make us irrational. <laughs> I really, I think love can very much make us irrational and make us do and say things that we might not do or say otherwise. And so I do think that we owe it, we all owe it to ourselves and to sort of culture in general to meaningfully think about our reactions and why we're having the reaction we do. Yeah. And to be brave enough to admit when that reaction comes from a place that is less than noble. And we all have those. I mean, I told you when I first found out that The Little Mermaid was going to be played by an African-American actress, it was a gut punch to me at first where I thought, you can't do that. And then I thought, oh God, wait, why am I thinking that? And it's because five-year-old Rodney sees redheaded Ariel. And like, for me, it's bound up in the nostalgia of that movie and my dad and Disney and childhood and blah, 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 blah. But it has nothing to do with that character or even that story. And there's no reason why that story can't be told in the way that it, it is going to be. And that's amazing. But even I had to give myself the space to think, okay, why did I have that visceral gut reaction to this story? And to say, yes, it has nothing to do with the story and a lot to do with me and my, my relationship to that story at the time that it came out. Yeah. And to, to be generous enough to say, yes, this was the story that I got. And I love it for a variety of reasons. And this new adaptation is going to be for a new generation of people. And for all those little Black girls who will see this Disney princess and think, oh my God, I get to be that too. And maybe I didn't need that in 1989. Like I got, I got Sebastian the Caribbean crab and I was like, got it, love it. This is amazing. And that was great for 89 and for 2022 or 2023, whenever that film comes out, that adaptation will explore and break new ground for a new generation of people. And that's the other thing we have to keep in mind about fantasy. If these things stayed exactly the way they were, many of these stories would have died. To bring it back around to Peter Pan, which we were talking about, if we were still producing J.M. Barry's 1904 original script of Peter Pan, it would have died. No one would know what the heck was going on for most of it because it is so intensely tied to period that it would not be able to bring in the global audience that it does. It needs adaptation to thrive and survive. And even something as sacrosanct as J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings also needs adaptation to survive and to, to have life. Otherwise, it becomes a dusty book on a shelf that, very, that, on, that maybe only academics are going to read. And that's not what we want. If we're really honest, I think none of us really want that because these stories deserve to live and they have to. And Although so we I, have to let them. I, like, I completely agree with you, except the one thing I say is I, I have to admit sometimes in the dark of night when, you know, the, the little thoughts come out, you go, it's nice that I know and love this text now before it became a mainstream thing and all these other people came in. I was there first. 
That oh, it's yes. nice knowing you're part of the in crowd. And I think there's a tiny element of that, that that that's an element of ownership that we like to claim on a text. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's tribal. Bringing in new voices, new views, different ways of looking at story. Like th this is why like, recently, obviously, I was at ICFA, and that's where we met. Mm -hmm. But it, it's why something like that is so brilliant. Because, and it's, I hope one of the reasons that we like we became friends is because it's the different views, the different ways of looking at something, and we both love the thing. And then seeing someone else take it apart, and you go, "Oh." I was blinded to that aspect mm -hmm. or someone else going, oh, it's really interesting when they do this thing. And you go, oh, I hadn't noticed that. That's actually, oh, that makes me rethink this, that we're constantly constructing and reconstructing narrative, even in the written text. The yes. more we think about it, the more we see it from different angles, we actually are changing our interpretation and understanding of the text. The text, the printed word stays the same, but our understanding, what the story is, changes. Yes. Um, and I think adaptation is a way to reflect that. And it has to be an adaptation of the time in which it is being made. You can't yes. pretend that you're adapting something from the 1920s and go, I'm just going to adapt it literally as it would have been in the 1920s. You, but your modern audience, culture has changed society has changed the audience you're trying to show it to has changed as is language these oh. things need to be borne in mind but it doesn't mean that the story can't survive and evolve along with us so what i wanted to say at the very end is thank you so much rodney like you have no idea how much i love having these conversations with you because well, I hope I add a little tiny bit to it, but you you always bring so much to it that gives me a new insight about things that I thought I had a handle on something. And you show me, maybe AP, you could consider that thing. And you're like, <laughs> making me think, <laughs> making me learn. So thank you so much, Rodney. Honestly, thank you for having me on here again and for giving me uh, the privilege of discussing these things with you. And honestly, I, we all need people who hold up mirrors. My students do it for me all of the time and make me challenge the views that I was raised with in the world that validated and supported those views, which now is rapidly changing. And so I, I love that you and I get to do that for each other. It, I think that is one of the reasons why we became good friends. So. Thank you very much, Rodney. Um, for all of you still watching, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your continued support and see you in the next video.